I will call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Education, which is duly noticed on February 23rd, 2021, through posting a notification of the press in accordance with State Statute 19.84. Let's rise for the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would entertain a motion to adopt the February 23rd agenda. Motion by Greg, second by Dale. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries 9-0. All commissioners are present this evening. Commissioner Dommerhausen with the safety message this evening. It's my pleasure to do that. I think is, and I'm going to kind of roll a couple of them together here. As most people probably know that Tiger Woods was but his legs are severely hurt, but he's not life-threatening or anything else. He but anyway, I want to kind of tie that into some of the rules we do that take care of us and make us better. Uh, we received no electronic citizen comments this evening, and we have no citizens here to speak to the board. So we will move on to the consent agenda. On the consent agenda this evening are approval of minutes, resig a resignation, no appointments, uh, several other um, budget transfers, etc. And we are extending the mask mandate through June 4th of 2021 through the end of the school year for our school and our students and staff. I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Moved by Greg, second by Carl. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you very much. Next, we have recognition of winter season high We're going to try to socially distance and spread these kids out. We're excited to... Group two. Some of you guys stay over here and... All right. Well, good evening. Thank you for... Thank you for inviting us um, here tonight as we recognize six outstanding uh, Parker High School student athletes. As athletic director at Parker, I am in here to introduce these athletes to you. Um, all of those who qualified for the WIAA state swim meet on February 6th. This year, we had two of our relay teams qualify for the state meet, our 200 medley relay and our 400 freestyle relay teams. Before we recognize these kids, I want to thank a few people um, first of all, Mr. Uh, Chris Lau, our principal, nurse Ashley Combs, Carrie Sento, our athletic trainer, Eric Lefebvre, our admin team, Jolene Tronis, Brian Martin, Jeff Farley, and from our district office, Chris Nicholson, Scott Gardner, Steve Pufal, and the entire school board for uh, giving us the opportunity to compete this winter and just supporting us for everything that, um, that we can do for athletics. I would like to also congratulate and recognize our swim coaches, Coach Eric Rhodes, who is in a much warmer place, uh, Alabama right now, as he is uh, watching his daughter swim. And then Coach Derek Schneider is actually our head co uh, girls coach, and we have a meet right now over at, at Parker against Milton, so he can't be here either. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot of positive buzz 
uh, positive energy and success stories coming from Parker Athletics over the last couple of years. Whether it be our regional champion baseball team last season, our volleyball team was also regional champions, our wrestlers who just finished their undefeated season, including two sectional qualifiers, our palms and cheer teams who are performing at a high level, and most recently our boys basketball team who are regional champions and on their way to sectionals this Thursday. It has been an exciting time with a lot of success stories to talk about here at Parker. What you typically hear about is the final scores, the championships, and the state qualifiers. I know for me personally, I'm really gonna miss uh, seeing Aaron walking down the hall at Parker uh, with a smile on his face, always the first one to stop by my classroom to say hi. So Aaron, uh, just thank you for everything that you've done for Parker Athletics thank, and Parker High School, and we wish you nothing but the best. Next is Ben Ralph. Here you are, Ben. Ben is a senior, most dedicated swimmer, has earned the most improved swimmer medal has participated in multiple sports, is on the high honor roll, and was a member of both state qualifying relay teams. I'm also gonna miss Ben for his senior leadership, his humor, and his outgoing personality here at Parker. Ben, thank you for your contributions to our athletic program, and we wish you all the best. Next, Xander Raleigh. Xander is a junior on the honor roll, was an MVP, has earned the most dedicated swimmer medal, is a three-time letter winner, is a soccer letter winner and has been an active participant in, our, participant in our musicals here at Parker. Next is Jackson Ryan. Jackson is a junior. He's on the honor roll, has earned most dedicated a most dedicated medal, is a two-time letter winner and a member of the Parker Swim State Qualifying Team. Next is Connor Ragula. I mess up his last name all the time. Connor is a sophomore on the honor roll, a letter winner, and was the member of, a park, of our Parker Swim State qualifying team. And then last but not least is our, our freshman, our lone freshman here, Zach Payne. Zach is a freshman who earned a letter this year and was a member of both state qualifying relay teams. As only a freshman, Zach is a high honor roll student who has an incredible work ethic and a very bright future ahead of him. So again, I wanna thank our school board for providing us the opportunity to compete this winter in education-based athletics and allowing us to attend tonight to honor these six exceptional Parker student athletes. So thank you. Welcome Ben. he said, but thank you for the opportunity to compete this winter. Um, these guys are very thankful as, as we all are. Um, all our student athletes Saturday, so we wish her well on Saturday. Um, I'd like to introduce our boys swim coach who could be here tonight, Matt Palma, uh, to talk about our boys state swim qualifiers who you see here in front of you today. So I'll give the mic over to Matt. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to, to recognize our team tonight. 
Uh, congrats to the Parker swimmers and all the other winter athletes that had excellent seasons. Um, while we're here to recognize our state qualifiers, all the boys on our team worked very hard this year, and they all had a great season. Everyone finished this season with a personal best time in their events. Our philosophy is to just do your best. Don't worry about the outcome. Just do your best. I can probably say all the guys did just that, and going to state is the icing on the cake. David, Caden, Ethan, and Ben dropped six seconds from their previous best relay time to qualify for the state meet in the 200 freestyle relay. At state, they finished with a time of 131.5, narrowly missing the school record. By finishing with a time of 325.21, which was again a best time for the relay on the year. Caden and Ethan. And we look forward to seeing what he can do next year. And Ben had an especially great year. In addition to the two relays he qualified in, he also qualified in both of his, his individual events the 200 freestyle and 100 butterfly. He finished in the top 16 in both events, earning the team our only points at state. Ben finished 15th in the 200 freestyle with a time of 147.48. He finished 14th in the 100 butterfly, setting a new school record with a time of 51.8. Uh, we recognize that the board has had to make many, many difficult decisions this year including the one to allow winter sports to go forward. We are thankful the boys had the opportunity to compete. And while going to state was a tremendous accomplishment for these four boys, the most important part of the season was to be able to get a workout in every day, interact with their friends, and, and have fun. And so it was a much needed sense of, of normalcy in this unusual time. So thank you. Introduce the guys individually. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Please. So uh, this is Caden, Ethan, and David, and Ben. And thanks to all the athletes for representing us well. Thank, thanks. All right. Thanks, boys. Have a great night. Thank you. It's always great to recognize... I bet student athletes. Oops. Well, Mr. Dan McCray is going to follow that. You're up, bud. Capital, <laughs> capital improvement referendum update. Dan McCray and JP Cullen, if they're here. Great. Thank you. I'll turn the clicker over to Tori. Uh, a quick introduction. Um, so again, we're very grateful uh, for the opportunity the community has afforded us to improve our secure pathways, uh, as well as boilers, and as well as some of our life safety system components within our buildings um, across the district. Uh, the first step of that, uh, if you will, three-step process is really focusing on our secure uh, entrances. And so we've engaged the services of Epstein U and Architects and J.P. Cullen uh, as the construction manager. Um, so I'm really going to just do a quick introduction of Tori Schulz, who is the project manager. Attendant and oversee all the work. And so he and Dave Leader um, will also develop, uh, excuse me, with the mass care, a very close relationship uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So without uh, much further ado, I'll turn it over to these uh, three very capable gentlemen representing
questions. Uh, last time we were in front of you was about a year ago, uh, talking about you know the secure pathway study that we had uh, undertaken for the district. EUA. I'm joined here by uh, Mike and Scott um, from JP Cullen. Um, I know Jeremy's not here this evening, but uh, Jeremy Sheckley is also uh, a key member of the team uh, representing the, the Cullen group. So as for EUA, uh, I'm the project manager on the job uh, and I work with a team of uh, talented architects and interior designers and uh, engagement specialists. Uh, some of which you see up on the screen here. My role is also to coordinate the efforts of any engineers that we might engage uh, to make these projects happen. So uh, Dan asked us here to give you an update on where we are with the project. Um, so tonight's going to be a very high level uh, update on, on the project so far, uh, what we're underway with currently. And just to give you an opportunity to ask you know some general questions about the work that uh, the team is undertaking right now. Uh, just to back up a step, uh, you may uh, remember these. These are the some just some of the mailers. Other district leaders. So how does this uh, how does this process take place? Well, at EUA we have a, a firm wide uh, uh, multi step process that we use called the lead process, and really it's it's an acronym that kind of drives how we engage with clients and help them uh, through the the uh, design and construction process, uh, and ultimately to a, a positive outcome. Uh, it starts off with the learn phase, which in in this case was the study that we did for the district last year, where we helped you know uh, evaluate the various buildings that this district has, and identify uh, opportunities for improving the secure uh, entry sequence for visitors into the buildings. Uh, we've now moved into the explore phase of the project, which <clears throat> in this phase we're testing ideas, getting some big ideas down on paper, figuring out what might be the best solution to move forward with. Once we're through that, we'll move into the articulate phase where we're actually refining that into usable construction drawings for the contractors to build. And then uh, the final step is the deliver uh, phase of the project where we're handing that information off to our friends at Cullen and they're building the work. So four-step process, um, we find great results by using this over and over again. And, and uh, I think it will prove to be very beneficial here. So. <laughs> You might recall some of these these uh, diagrams. These were uh, exhibits that were included in the study packet from last summer. Where we're at right now is taking these diagrams, um, going an another layer deep, uh, so to speak, with each one of these to try to identify in those color-coded areas what the actual you know uh, opportunities are to improve the security in each of those locations. So our team of, of architects right now, along with Mike and Scott and Dan and his team are working with the principals at each of these locations at the, the schools uh, here to try to understand what their particular needs are and how we might um, improve the security at each of these locations. We don't have any final drawings yet. We're still very early in the process. So unfortunately, I don't have anything more to show you at this point in time, but work is underway. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike here. Uh, and Scott to talk about the, the kind of overall time frame and the process for making sure that the project moves smoothly through design and bidding and construction. Um, do you have any questions so far about the, the work that we're underway with? Anything that we can answer?
schedule, um, electrical plans, uh, paint uh, spec books and things like that is updating the budget as we move along. Um, and then working with Scott, we also develop in conjunction with the district and the principals and the representatives um, a phasing plan. And in this case, we've, um, we'll just kind of hit them here, but we've developed three construction phases, keeping in mind um, as we move uh, from this meeting, everything here is, is a fluid thing, right? Is a fluid process. Um, but as we've identified in a snapshot in today's uh, timing, uh, the following schools here, Adams, Harrison, Jefferson, Lincoln, Van Buren, and Washington would fall into a phase one and take this discussion and kind of rinse and repeat for phases two and three. But uh, we are currently in the design phase focused specifically on these schools. And the design phase is going to get us through the month of March. And then we move into a bidding phase where we actually put together bid packages and we put the, pro the finished drawings out on the street for bidding. And that's going to happen in April and May. And that allows us from a scheduling standpoint, right, to, to break ground, as we say, on the, in the actual schools for this um, category of schools, this phase of schools starting in June. And we see this phase one with the level of need in these buildings will get done in the summer of 2021. And that, I don't know if you had anything to add or. No, you had it. Okay. <laughs> So again, rinse and repeat, right? So phase two, we've identified some schools and working with the district and the teams of um, the next level of, of priority. And we are balancing uh, the practical means of what can we physically get done from a construction standpoint in these durations uh, and also the design side of it, right? So we need to have a, a complete set of bid documents and understanding. So, um, We've kind of forecasted through all the way into 2022, so June of, um, oh, I got to get to the next phase. I'm jumping ahead. We are into August of 2022, as you'll see in the next phase. So Craig Kennedy, Franklin Rock River Charter, Roosevelt, in, the, in this building here, the ESC. Um, and then we've summarized kind of collectively all three phases. But basically, you can see we're going to be working through the design phase in some level of phase one, two, and three, all the way through Thanksgiving. And then the bidding part, right, as we put documents together and out for bid for phase one, we will sharpen the pencil on the budget, right? We'll have actual hard competitive bid numbers, and the budget will continue to grow, and that's where Dan and I will continue to be the best of friends and work through that process and, <laughs> and, and just deliver budget updates. Mm -hmm. And on the, the, the yellow line here, the construction side of it, Scott's going to be leading the charge on that. But in the design and the bidding phase, it's critical that he's incorporated in that process. So we can think about things like uh, traffic safety for the kids. I shouldn't say traffic safety for kids, but pedestrian control for students, right? We, we've got construction going on. So Scott's going to help support and, and get us critically thinking about getting kids in and out through the construction safely and phasing. And we will coordinate those meetings on a one-on-one um, -on -one basis with from school to school, because each school is gonna have a different need based on the, the kids' age levels and the, and the floor plan and things like that and the physical nature of the building. So <laughs> I think, yeah, that's um, again, very high level. Uh, we can probably at least go back to that screen. And if there are any um, questions on what you've seen or. Yes, thank you for coming and going through this. Uh, that explains a lot. I, ha I do have some que questions. This will be a combination of remodeling, uh, which means taking out walls, different things, and adding back and putting it there. Is there any new construction on the outside of the buildings uh, that would act actually add physical space in some areas, especially in, I look at Adams and I look at Wilson and some of those. Sure. Um, we don't know for sure the answer to that question. We are not anticipating based upon the, the work that we think we're going to have to undertake that we won't have to expand outward at any of the locations. We'll be able to remodel within the current footprint of the building. But, you know, as we get in further and look at each location specifically, uh, you know, that might change. But right now where we're at today, uh, I don't see 
any outward expansion of the buildings. Yeah, the, only, the only reason I said there might be some areas where you may have not, not have any choice, with especially the older buildings, where they have some pretty solid walls oh, yeah. <laughs> and moving them because they, they could be load supporting a variety of things that you may have to buckle out a few feet and, yep. and come back to accomplish your goal. So yeah. that was the question I asked. Right. Uh, and and we'll, we'll evaluate all of those possible impacts. You know, the age of the building certainly comes into play, but you know, our, our friends at Colin will help us make sure that we're making smart decisions so that if we do need to look at a, a different solution, yeah. Um, that we have them on board to help us yeah. through that process. I'm glad we're moving ahead, so thank you. Thank you. Great. So with each phasing, you know, as you look at it, you know, phase one and phase three are really construction just, it appears just over this summer. And in phase two, it's like all school year long. Why is that the case? So right now, the why, why we have that set up that way is because it's tied in with the design phases. And that's something I brought up with some of the district leaders last week was we need to with each school then you're going to recost it correct correct yes, yes. so so colin's been around for a couple of years uh i believe it's over 100 um but we've we have historical data right on construction and renovation so it's um an educated system and process that we use uh on I don't, yeah, it, <laughs> um, we use historical data from jobs based on projects per square foot or cost per square foot. In some cases, we consult with local um, contractors and electricians to try to get those numbers. And then we also include things uh, like construction contingencies for those unknowns. So globally, that uh, referendum approval has uh, a contingency built in for those unknowns. And then the benefit of um, doing these incremental budget updates allows us to just keep us all in check, right? And make sure that um, we're not developing Them, right and and Dan I believe we sold the bonds at one little over one percent so the community is investing 22 million dollars into our buildings and you're helping us get the best bang for the buck and get as far as we can on the prioritization that we spent the last 10 years looking at for safety and secure entrances yep. is that that's correct okay other questions Greg uh, just a comment so been on the evaluation team and, and really why we chose EUA and Cullen is number one, they work well together and in working well together, they had a history of doing projects close, to, reasonably close to their estimates. So there was some comfort level really to speak to your question, Dale, um, with that based on the history they've done. Um, 
and the performance they've had. So we did factor that into that selection process. Other questions? Well, we look forward to the updates. We thank the community for investing. Uh, this is a tremendous improvement for the district and keeps us in step with our buildings and safety and, and frankly, making us stay up with all of the other communities and their facilities. So appreciate your work. Look forward to future updates. Thank you. All right, have a good evening. Next, we have 3.3. Presentation of the Elementary Bridges Math Adoption, Allison DeGraff. So Allison, you're gonna talk about bridges and the construction guys are leaving. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just baffled. Wow, all right, you're up. All right, well, good evening. Um, tonight, we want to take a minute to share with you an update on the adoption and the implementation of the Elementary Bridges K-5 math curriculum. And we had previously discussed at board meetings and PPC um, the adoption process. And so we were able to share with you the opportunity that we were able to include teachers from all 12 elementary schools as well as principals as stakeholders in selecting this material um, and in this resource that we have implemented this year. So tonight we have some guests and I'm gonna start with um, Tanya Wojohowicz, which is our district math and science coordinator. And she has helped been the lead facilitator in this adoption process. And so she wants to start by sharing with you a little bit about um, our vision and why we selected Bridges. Good evening, as you heard, I'm Tanya Wojohowicz and I'm the K-12 Math and Science Coordinator here at the School District of Janesville. And it was an honor to be asked and come get to speak to you a little bit more about something I'm excited about and love. Um, so we started this process um, the year before um, this. And we really started first with a conversation K-12 about what it is it that we want for our students. And as we had that discussion, you can see um, the fruits of that on the page in front of you. We involved stakeholders in that discussion as well because we wanted to make sure that our students left our buildings being able to serve our community and that they were college and career ready. And so as you look at that list in front of you, you're gonna notice um, not only were we looking at academic outcomes, but we were looking at the soft skills that kids need to be successful um, beyond the walls of our buildings. And more importantly, we also looked at, um, we wanted them to have positive learning experiences. We wanted them to find a joy and love in math and a joy and love with learning that they could take um, beyond their. So why amongst all the choices was Bridges? As you look on the screen in front of you, um, this. We wanted to make sure that that math not only reflected our diverse student population, but helped meet their needs, whether it was students who were at or above grade level. It supported our students and supported our staff in meeting our students' needs. And then, of course, you know, we wanted kids to get messy with the math. And so as you talk to people or if you're in our classrooms or hear about bridges or have had experiences um, with them as a parent um, or, you know, just a supportive partner, you're going to see kids with their hands on. Um, obviously, COVID safety practices, too. But you're going to see kids actually interacting and engaging with the math and getting, as I like to call it, messy with the math. Um, 
So like I said, this process started before um, the current year. And part of that was helping make sure that our staff had what it is that they needed to be successful in implementing a new curriculum, especially in a year that poses some unique challenges. Um, and so last year, we started that journey with supporting our staff with a better understanding of the resource. And then obviously in a unique school year, um, Bridges, as did other resources, started um, releasing virtual learning supports. And so they've engaged in ongoing professional development to learn how to better use resources in a virtual environment and still provide students opportunities to access grade level math curriculum, as well as interact with some of those things we maybe would have been, excuse me, would have been um, physically touching that maybe sometimes we can't, or we would have had discourse, you know, in, in groups that sat closer together, and now we're making modifications for that. And so we spent time um, building and supporting capacity for how to provide instruction um, in, in the current environment so that our students are safe. Um, and I think something that's important to know is we wanted a process in supporting our teachers that was proactive in meeting their needs, but responsive to the needs that come up as they arise. And so we have um, an implementation, implementation support team or the IST team as, as we like to call them. It's representative of our staff at large um, and it's representative of every single elementary school. Um, there are a formal feedback loop as well as an informal one for our team. We give surveys to our staff we conduct learning walks trimesterly in all of the buildings. And so again, we're just trying to look at where are our glows and where are our grows. How is it that we can be responsive to either remove obstacles and challenges that our teachers are facing with implementation this year, or just continue to build from the strengths um, that we have in place when it comes to math. And so as um, Tanya mentioned that we have um, been participating in learning walks. And so learning walks is um, one of the strategies we use, um, we've been using as a district to support all 12 elementary schools in the implementation of bridges. And so Tanya, um, the principal and our academic learning coach opportunity to get into all of the buildings and help build that accountability for all of us using um, the resource with fidelity. So we want to have the opportunity for the board to hear is really what is this like in the classroom? That's the most important part, right? What does it look like? So we have two teachers here today, Carrie Seiler and Nikki Trudeau, who um, are two of the amazing teachers that are have Thank you. All right, well, thank you for having us. I'm Nikki Trudeau, as she mentioned. I'm a third grade teacher at Harrison Elementary, and Bridges is new for me as well as everyone else in the district. Um, as Tanya mentioned, there were challenges. We had that time at the beginning of the year to prep, but it's a continuous, you know, we have to stay a little bit after school, and I'm very thankful that we have um, para support that can help us, you know, prepare for the next unit. It's a lot of preparation. The resource came with a lot of materials, but there's a lot of things that we have to also collect ourselves, like egg cartons, toilet paper rolls, such as that. 
Um, so what it looks like in the classroom, we have a number corner per day, and then we have a map. So the district, awesome. We purchased both parts of the math curriculum. They go hand in hand. So number corner is a designated area in our classroom. So that was kind of tricky at the beginning of the year because of digital resources, you know, special for this year. So be, the kids can't all come to the number corner, but um, we're also able to display it on the smart board. So even the kids in the back have access to that material. So number corner is like a calendar grid. There's lots of different skills the kids get. And it's nice because it really previews what's coming up in our math units. Um, so it's that spiral review. We might introduce fractions back in September. It's not necessarily for mastery, but the kids are gonna keep getting it. And the units are really nice because it lets you know if the skill is to be mastered at that time in the school year. So that's really important as we're approaching conferences to communicate that with families. Um, that, so we have number corner and then we have our math time during the day. As I mentioned, the number corner really goes hand in hand. With, um, there's lots of discourse. So that's something we've been working on um, as a building and I think as a district, having the students be Maybe a number corner, but mainly in the regular math. And so workplaces are games. So the kids are practicing. We might do a little lesson. And the kids are practicing the skills, not only for that unit, sometimes it's from previous units. So again, with COVID, we've had to get creative in how we're going to do that. Um, Bridges does have the workplaces digitally. So it's been nice if kids have to quarantine, um, they can still access those materials. Um, as Tanya mentioned, all the manipulatives, again, they have them digitally. So even if students do have to be um, learning from home at the time, they still have access to all that on their iPads or their devices. Um, the kids, in regards to engagement, they love it, they're excited. I know with learning walks and you know just having principals and other support staff in, the kids are really engaged and excited. They are able to talk. You know, sometimes there's times during the day where they have to work quietly and they know during math they're gonna get to talk and share. They might not all get to share out loud to the class. Go around and the discussion forum to know like what strategies are kids using? Is that an entry point strategy? How can you support that student to work towards a more efficient strategy? Um, in regards to achievement, I was really looking forward to the winter star because the kids had touched on so many more skills than they had in the previous years. Um, for example, we hadn't covered fractions until in previous years right before forward. And then we'd cram to try to get all these skills in that hadn't come in the units yet. Whereas this, I felt prepared even for the winter star, like the kids are gonna rock this because they have been exposed to all these skills. And even if they weren't for mastery, they had some sort of idea how to approach these problems. Um, so all my students did show growth on their star. And so I'm really looking forward to doing these problems for no reason, it all comes together and it's applied to real world experiences. So even for myself,
continued growth. And I'm very thankful that we got the Bridges curriculum. Yep. For those that are watching this, what the star and the forward are. Okay, so the star. Now, I don't know. I'm not very good at articulating. I'm going to let you know now. So star is a nation. Help me out. Standards. I'm so sorry. Come on over. I don't want to say the wrong information here. It's our district-wide assessment for literacy and math, but it's nationally normed so that when our students take the test, we can see where our students are at in comparison to students across the state and the nation in ELA and math. Thank you. I didn't want to say it incorrectly. Okay. Um, but again, I really am liking the resource. I think putting in the time this year, it's going to have lots of benefits moving forward. Thank you. Hello, I am Carrie Seiler and I'm fourth grade at Van Buren. And a lot of what I'm going to say is going to sound a little bit repetitive. Um, we're definitely reiterating some of the things that Nikki had mentioned. Um, Nikki mentioned the number corners and then there's bridges. So number corners to me is, um, I really like that because it's kind of like the taste. It's your appetizer to some of the math lessons within bridges. It gives the kids a nice overview, a nice introduction of different topics within the month. One of the areas is calendar collector, and it is a collection of things. We've practiced measurements, measurement conversion, um, improper mixed and different fractions, mixed numbers. And moving, having that knowledge from prior calendar collection times within the month, as we move into Bridges lessons, we are looking at that as the huge unit overview and topic. So they're feeling a little bit more confident and comfortable moving into those lessons within the unit, which is obviously going to increase our students' engagement and um, just their ability to kind of get those risks and trying new topics and not being afraid of what typically fourth graders would feel is very scary when we look at fractions and decimals. Kind of like Nikki had mentioned, we might be introduced to a topic just to get that comfortability level in the beginning, and then we come back to it later in the school year to go a little bit deeper and to, um, at, point, at some point, get to that level of mastery. And others, um, the workplaces that she mentioned as well, they have those engaging games that will support the current learning. Um, one point I like about that too is though we have the digital component, we use that in class. And then I also send the students home with a paper copy of it and encourage them to explain it to a family member and then to challenge them to play it. And that most typically in our classroom is um, what we're using for our Wednesday digital day. Instead of always doing a Zoom, um, we switch it up and I ask them to play the game digitally with somebody at home and then they can take a screenshot and share it or they can do that paper version and um, take a picture and upload it that way too. So then it's also getting that home connection. Parents are aware of what we're working on and they're getting to see just the high rigor of what students student growth, uh, definitely loving the fact that they are getting that exposure to all of the topics uh, before having to cram it all in for forward. Um, they're feeling more confident. We're feeling more confident. And obviously, if we're feeling good about it, that's going to transcend to our students as well. Um, our I was going to get into SGPs. It's just a growth goal. Um, we want to see, I think uh, Allison had mentioned at the last meeting that 50 is what we want to see our students have by the end of the school year. Uh, my class that I, the students that I started with at the beginning of the school year, our median SGP was a 33. Um, at this winter, or at the winter star test time, our median SGP, again, with that same pool of students, is at 66. So we're definitely seeing um, the, like I said, that rigor being there and the growth. So loving it. It is definitely a ton of work. It is, we definitely appreciate it.
shifted to or pivoted to virtual. So it was incredibly um, useful and we were very grateful for that. So next year won't be. feedback from parents, um, just so you can have some feedback um, from people across the district as well um, as to how they're feeling about bridges. And one, I just want to point out, this was one of our EL teachers who shared this quote, just um, I appreciate that said, imagine a group of third graders who skip on the way to math every day because they're so excited about it. So the fact that um, this math is a rigorous program and kids love it and are excited about it. Um, and so we just wanted to have some time for you to, to read those quotes. Um, also, we did get some quotes from students as well. Um, and as we mentioned, you heard both of our amazing teachers talk about number corners. And so definitely a lot of the quotes from the kids are their favorite part of math is um, number corners. And so it's great to see that they're able to share what they love about math as well. Um, I'm going to have Tanya share a couple strengths, and then we'll we'll close with where um, we have um, some growth for this year. So I know you heard a lot of those strengths. Um, what I'm hearing from our administrative team and from our teachers on the floor is our kids are seeing concepts earlier, they're going deeper, and they're being successful with it. And I'm not a great storyteller, but I think some great examples I've seen this year. I walked into a classroom earlier in the year in Madison, and the teacher's like, hold on before you leave, hold on. I'm like, all right. And they're like, OK, class, what's your favorite workplace? There's six of them in this particular unit. And within like five seconds, five were already shouted out. And that was every kid in the entire class. And so when you think about that, that each class um, made had a different perspective of what their favorite was and that idea. twice during math. And it wasn't because the teacher's like, let's give a shout out. It was like they flipped over the calendar marker for the day and the kids who had just got done making predictions on their whiteboards were like, yes! Even one of the little kids on the corner who you know was still working towards it, got part of it right, was so excited. And to have that sense of efficacy as a child and to view yourself as a capable learner um, who loves something was important to us. And so to see that every day in our classrooms is really validating of the hard work that the committee did and what our teachers are doing you know, every day Day to bring learning alive, you know, for, for our children. And so, you know, um, I'm excited. I hope you have the opportunity um, soon to be able to visit some of our classrooms and actually see it in action, you know, to ask um, your students, your neighbors, your partners, whoever they are, constituents of, you know, the experiences that they're having. You know, um, we definitely know the challenges and feel that lift both from our students as we increase the rigor and, and for our staff, but they've also met that with grace and demonstrated success with it. And so our goal is to continue on that journey and continue to support our students year after year to continue to see an increase um, and growth and see, you know, kind of the pay it forward as they go into um, the secondary level, having those skills they need to be successful as they continue on that journey towards, you know, whatever their life goals are beyond the walls of our institutions. So, so as we finish and close tonight, um, of course, we, you know, want to let you know there are challenges. It's um, the teachers have done an amazing implement a new resource, again, the, ex the expectation is that kindergarten students have had this math in kindergarten first and second and third, 
So our fourth and fifth graders had a little bit more of a challenge because they hadn't had the background in this resource as other resources. So you'll hear more from some of our fourth and fifth grade teachers, the challenges that they felt this year with that as well. And then both teachers spoke to the heavy time and preparation that's um, involved in, in this as well. So we want to recognize that that has been very challenging for teachers as well. helpful to have that time to really spend more time in bridges and um, dig deeper into the resources. Um, so what's a glimpse of that data so far? So if we look at this data, last year we look at um, our fall to winter scores in STAR. And this data is called pathway to proficiency. So it predicts the percentage of students that may be proficient and advanced on the state exam. So you can look at in 2019-20, where our students were at in the fall, where they were at in the winter, and the growth that they made um, in the winter. If you look at 2020-21 this year, where we had some unfinished learning in the spring, um, and so we knew that some kids were going to come in with some learning loss. And so you can see that in the fall. If you look at where our if, if second graders were in 1920, that would be the same group in third grade. So you can see the drop that happened during that time. But what you can see is our Bridges curriculum um, has really been comprehensive in the way it supports all students. So you can look at the significant growth that's happened this year in comparison to the prior year. So we're really seeing some significant growth initially. So we're excited to see some of that, that data as well and, and validates all of the, the work that um, our teachers have been doing to really make this successful and to really help engage the students in learning. And so just to close, and again, um, you know, we appreciate the opportunity, um, you know, and appreciate that that Steve and, and Dan know that we want to commit all of these resources to finding the right resource and commit um, financially to creating this resource that will really create consistency and rigor for our students in math. And so to close, we know that prior to this, we had kind of six different core math resources going on at elementary and a lot of different supplementary resources. And now we have one for all 12. So to close, I just want to leave with a quote from one of our principal, a veteran principal of 12 years. And he had been in classrooms on the learning walks observing the teachers. And so he wanted to come back and write a letter to his teachers. And so this is the beginning of the letter that he said to them. He said, I to his teachers, he said, I would first like to begin by saying how impressed I am with the intensity, the quality and consistency of all your instruction this year with Bridges implementation. In typical times, the work is outstanding. In a pandemic, this work is extraordinary. As a result of this pacing, our math content in my 12 years at Jefferson, instruction has never been tighter and more consistent than it currently is, and I would extend this across the district as well. So thank you. Complexity you're going through and just changing one curriculum is just overwhelming. Now, was this about a two-year the resource, we spent a year in professional development, helping teachers um, learn about what the new shifts in math, the math standards at the state level had been as well. So really a, a lot of intense time in professional development. And then that also helping us select the right resource for our students. So. And my second question is, um, how does this play into our curriculum at the middle and high school level eventually in math? So one of the things we did with, oh, sorry. 
we were fortunate at the same time to get some development on quality resource um, selection. We had multiple vetting teams that actually went through and looked at multiple resources and kept narrowing the funnel down to the last two. Um, and then ultimately bridges. And one of the things that we learned and did is brought together a K-12 committee. And so the vision work you saw in the building um, in the beginning of the presentation came out of that committee. But one of the lenses we looked through was this idea of vertical coherence. And so we use um, the open And so the math routines that our students are seeing K-5 are the same ones that they see six, six through eight. The double number lines become something in math called tape diagrams. And so the models they're seeing, the representations they're seeing, how they talk about math, the same notice and wonder um, strategies and activities they're doing K-5, they're seeing in six, eight um, as well right now. And so the purpose of that committee was to take a look through all of our levels so that we had continuity and it wasn't like kids were every time they made a transition from, you know, five to six and then again from um, eight to nine having to relearn different target language or relearn different strategies to apply in different ways. They're doing those things right now um, in the resources. And so it's exciting. Our, our middle school team this year, we talked about their um, in sixth grade by the end of first quarter, our And when we get a chance to do some vertical teaming from different levels to talk, because they get to share now some of the same experiences and see, oh, that's how. A little more help understanding the district data schedule. So, so these numbers come from the STAR test? All yes. These? Okay. STAR assessment. So let's follow the second grader in two. Uh, so I'm in second grade in 19 and 20, and I come to school in the fall, and then this is a, must be the, all the kids. This is a score for the, all the second graders, yeah. right? Some sort of. Yes, from Average. all 12 elementary schools. Um, okay. Yep. All the students that are using um, Bridges this year, the data is from. And they score a 37 on a STAR test. So how does that, at that point in time, how, did, how does that compare to the state natural average? I mean, what's a 37? I don't know what that means. Sure. This is our um, mid-year data, so the pathway to proficiency. So for a third grader... Um, and so where we hope, um, so about the state average right now for a third grader in math is about 40 or 41. And that was, you know, prior to COVID because we didn't have any state assessment last year. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, right now, even our, our third grade is a little bit above where that state average was mid-year already before um, the last time we previously took the test two years ago when we had data. So yours in third grade. So third grade in 1920, they got a 37. And that's just a below state average, that their, right? That was their mid-year data. So we sure. didn't get a chance to see their end of year data. So they, they could have been closer to, to the state average. Does that make sense when they took the test in the spring? But we don't know. So then, then you carry this over to the winter and they had a 46. I mean, how do you you're get looking at which you're looking at the winter of third grade? Well, let's let's start in 1920. Okay. In the fall, they got a 37. Correct. On their start test, and your and the average is state average is 41 ish. You said right? Yeah. At the end of third, at the end of third grade. So when they're coming in, they may be a little below the state average, 
um, because the test in the spring measures third graders in the spring of third grade. So the fall, we look at where their data is at and we're trying to get them to that spring score. So that yes, they were below where the state average was at that time, yep. but we hope by the time they take it in the spring that they've increased to that state average. Well, I'm still, I I'm just can't so connect here. So if you here. look at those third graders in the fall, they were at 37. Why, so, why do, I, I keep starting at second grade and then somehow I, I'm in third grade. Oh, okay. So if you look at so, if you look at second grade in the fall, yep, thirty-seven. You were at thirty-seven. In nineteen twenty. Yep. yep. And then by the middle of the year in winter, yep. they were already at forty-five. So okay. they had made growth. So you can see how they grow from the fall to the spring to get closer to where we're trying to get them okay. up to that state average or past that state average. And that evidently is at or above state average yes. for that particular group. All right. Now they go the next year, they're third graders now. Yes. Right? And they in the beginning of the year, and it's new curriculum, right? Right. Or new stuff, right? And they score a 19 for numbers of reasons, primarily COVID, right? They're not in school. Right. Right? Is that my... But by the time they tested, um, this last test was must have been pretty recent. Yeah, just a few weeks ago. Just a few weeks ago. They were at a 43 and that's a that's a big leap, and then and we're still using for the forty is forty one ish is kind of an that's average. The last data we have from this. Okay, year. all right. Um, I'm stretching it here. Would you say the board's decision to keep elementary kids in school helped drive these numbers? I think that. Yes, this curriculum is very much a hands-on curriculum. Um, and okay, so, that's... Yes. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other questions? Thank you again for coming back and presenting this. Um, you did a great job, and I think it's really important work, and I love how you were honest about um, the challenges that you've had and the hard work it's been, but um, and transparent about that, but I... I really appreciate mostly you both talked about the improvements that you've seen because I feel like a lot of what we hear and read is the gap our kids are, are going to have coming out of this and you guys are showing that you are bridging that gap and doing really good work and I have a fourth grader uh, Carrie so I hear and learn this too so I, I might take your idea I hope that you guys share I'm sure you do at PD share best practices because I love your idea about doing a game at home um, because I'm thinking maybe that's how Brady's going to earn his PlayStation time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you for doing that. So no, but great job, you guys. This is so good. It's such a good talking point. I, and I love what we got 20 to one, Allison, what, what 26 different things to one. That's another you know common talking point in the community is, oh, so many different math what styles out there and, and curriculum and now we have one and it's just doing such, such good by our kids so thank you for that thank you and i had the chance to watch the ppc meeting and your presentation was much longer so i appreciate that it wasn't quite that long but tremendous information uh that's why i asked you to come to do the board because the community won't all watch those committee meetings but the information is tremendous and it isn't free to buy, buy these adoptions. I don't know what the contract was, but Dan did share that this is, we've spent over $450,000 on this adoption for 5,000 kids. The community invested that. So that's why we went to referendum. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Thanks. Thanks for coming back. I believe she's taking you out for lunch tomorrow. I, I think that's what it was. Either Allison or Tanya. Thank you. All right, we have Mr. Lau and Mrs. Bian with an update on the AVA curriculum plan option four. All right. 
Well, good evening. We're, it's a pleasure to be back here and to share some positives with you um, this evening. We met with um, PPC a couple of weeks ago and talked about some options that we've put in place to um, help our students um, continue to move forward and meet that promise of all kids graduating. And we're just going to share an overview of those things with you tonight. Um, all right. All right, so just a little bit of sort of big picture setting and, and context for the conversation. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic has, has caused uh, a lot of different things to play out in our society and in education. And uh, across the nation, we've seen uh, some higher rates of failure than we have historically. And students and families are really struggling in lots of ways. Um, and we wanted to mention that because as much as that is true across the nation, it is right here in Janesville too. Um, and so, Anytime we have a failure, we miss a credit opportunity. And if we miss enough of those credit opportunities, then that district promise we have about an on-time graduation becomes more and more difficult to attain. Uh, so Chris and I and the teams that we work with decided that it would make more sense to do something about that proactively rather than waiting for those missed credit opportunities to accumulate and be facing that challenge when students are seniors. Um, the first option that we're going to talk a little bit about, we refer to as our option four. Um, you know, as you know, we had three options for students to choose at the front end of the year. And right now we have a group of students that, for a number of reasons, weren't successful first semester. And they are doing their learning. There's about 125 of them. Um, they're doing their learning with teachers that distancely with teachers. Teachers come on and do a live lesson with them. They follow a bell schedule. They have the ability to interact with their peers online um, through Google Meet. Um, they're learning Janesville curriculum. Um, teachers are able to modify things for them. And we've built in opportunities for them to recover credit and standards that they missed first semester. Um, you know, in, in, in some cases, we have students that weren't finding success for almost a year in the way that we were doing school. They've re-engaged, they're finding success, they're feeling good about themselves, and we're moving them closer to graduation. We should mention with that particular option, um, it's it's a credit recovery program, mm -hmm. very much focused on re-engagement. So there's a, a narrow mm -hmm. menu um, of course offerings mm -hmm. available, delivered by you know mm -hmm. uh, school district of Janesville teachers mm -hmm. following our curriculum. But um, students in that program don't have the the full catalog available that we're able to offer mm -hmm. in our two high schools. Yeah. Um, interesting side note, um, as an offspring of their English class, they were talking about Black History Month and Martin Luther King and just started to have a conversation about what do we call the program that we're in? Option four isn't really all that exciting. So they, <laughs> they, they it sounds like you're treating something, not teaching something. Um, so they put together options. All the students suggested, they voted, um, they had conversations about this. And in the end, they decided that they wanted to call this the MLK virtual program. And um, I share a quote with you that from Martin Luther King that was part of their learning. And really what it talks about is the importance of keeping moving, being tenacious, looking for different options. And that's something that our teachers have worked very hard to provide our students and they're finding success with that. We also love the Crosstown Unity. If you go back yes. to the logo there for just a second, of course, kids from Craig and Parker are part mm -hmm. of this virtual program. And so uh, we've got both of our school colors represented. And then that tie dye in the middle, right? That, that sort of unity piece that the students and teachers and principals mm -hmm. from both schools are working together to make mm -hmm. this work for those 125 students. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Um, as, as we said earlier, kids are, and, and parents are, very positive about this opportunity that we've provided to them. Um, here's some quotes that students shared um, with their teachers. Attending live lessons makes it much easier to stay on pace. The workload is manageable. The teachers are very accommodating and work to ensure that students have many chances to succeed. I'm participating in more in school than I ever did before. It's a great opportunity for students to recover credits and learn things I missed in the fall. So kids are engaged, kids are learning, kids are finding success um, in ways that they've not, and we're responsive to their needs because these are also students that, for whatever reason, they're not able to come into school face-to-face -face for their learning. For them to learn, they have to be remote in some way because of the impact that COVID has on them or their, their living situation. 
So that's that's really been a huge win for us and the kids that we're serving. All right, so uh, the next option, which we call option five, I know we're very creative here, uh, is really self-directed learning that um, we're uh, delivering through Edmentum. Um, Edmentum is a, an online platform that we use for credit recovery purposes. So we have uh, a group of students that um, did not find, and I'm sorry, this is the, the senior's senior only option. one. Yes. 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 So we have two different versions of this. So this is actually something different. Um, we have a group of seniors who are really close to completing credits, um, and they did not find success with other online options. They probably did not need the number of credits that uh, the kids in the fourth option needed. Um, and so they're sort of working in a self-guided way and we support them with progress monitoring and personal contacts and programming that's really narrowed on just the credits they need to complete their mm -hmm. diploma and move on. So it's a, it's a small number, mm -hmm. um, and we're just really focused on getting them through what they need to get that high school diploma. Yeah. And, and if they have the ability to come in for help, they're able to connect with our academic learning coaches, our counselors, us, to get the support that they need. Now. Right. Oh, oh. yes. A little bit out of order. Here are the, the, the teachers that are working with our option four kids. Um, all of them are very skilled educators from Parker and Craig. We're just extremely proud of the work that they've done to make this option come alive for our, our kids. We meet with them twice a week to talk through how things are going, to offer supports and troubleshoot. And, you know, they're always a couple steps ahead of us about, you know, how could we change this? How can we engage more kids? Here's something we've noticed that this student needs. So they've done a very nice job making that their own in a short period of time. We created something in a couple of weeks from something we never had before. So a lot of the shout out needs to go to all of them for their hard work. All now right, the now the piece that we yes. call option five. So um, this is still a bit of a work in progress. Um, we are capitalizing on the fact that we have an off-campus learning day. Mm -hmm. So with that A, B rotation, students go to school, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we have Tuesday and Thursday available to us. Mm -hmm. And so for those students who missed credits first semester, we're inviting them in to work on, again, this through this Edmentum curriculum, credit recovery. Um, they're guided by content area teachers during that time who can do mini lessons if they notice, for example, that I'm struggling with factoring and I'm stuck in that point in my math course. I might get help on that with another, a couple of other students who need that help or even one-on-one -on -one kinds of supports if necessary. So we're calling this thing option five. This is really uh, available to students in any grade. That would include seniors um, that you know, don't need that other option we're talking about. So they may have missed um, you know, one or more classes in terms of credit. Uh, and this is very much focused on the core right? So math, science, social studies, English. And the whole point with all of these things is we don't want to get to the end of someone's senior year and go, oh my gosh, we have all these things that we need to do. You know, we, we have some flexibility in our schedule now. We have some flexibility with resources and we want to make sure that we're engaging kids as much as possible to keep them moving forward. I wanted to share that, you know, just like we've seen success with option four this morning, a, a young lady who was invited to do option five with us because she didn't find perhaps all the success we would have hoped for a semester stopped by my office just to make sure this morning that she knew exactly which day she was supposed to be there. And so, you know, I think with, with all these options we've created, we've seen engagement from mm -hmm. students that um, struggled for different mm -hmm. reasons for yep. a semester. And um, I think that's been the, the kind of motivator mm -hmm. for us to keep mm -hmm. going and try to be creative, um, get the right staff helping us think outside the box a little bit. Um, and the good news is that I think we're making some progress toward keeping mm -hmm. as many students as possible moving toward that on-time graduation. I talked a little bit yep. about the first couple, mm -hmm. and I, there's two other groups we should thank in addition to our teachers. One is our student services teams. Um, there really isn't an easy way 
to figure out who needs which program short of going through hundreds of lines of grading data and talking with kids and families once you look through that data to know what might fit best. What are the kind of family pieces that need to be considered, the student issues that need to be considered. Um, and certainly we have to thank some of the folks in the room here and who aren't in the room here this evening, the district leaders who have encouraged us to think outside the box, look for other solutions, remember what's important and keep us focused on, on that promise. So, you know, thank you to Steve and Allison and Kim and Scott and others who meet with us regularly. Um, we throw ideas out every once in a while and we get good feedback from them. So we appreciate that. Yep. Any questions that you have for us? Thank you. It's nice to see all the options. Um, um, so the, this, a couple of questions. Um, the students that are t doing the uh, option three, four, no, wait a minute, four. Probably the mm -hmm. first one we talked yep. about. Yes. Yep. Yes. Um, not the Edmentum one, yep. but the, uh, the virtual yep. program. Um, and so, so these, are, these are students that are behind in credits. And they're also probably still taking other classes, right? They're the taking all of their courses through this program at this time. The amount of time that they they meet every day. Okay. So that's one difference. So we've increased the amount of time, and the classes are longer. So they. just finished subject selection, we've asked them to subject select the next course in the sequence. Mm -hmm. the, the goal is in that those additional instructional minutes, we're gonna capture back what we lost and try to keep us on pace with this mm -hmm. semester's standards as well. Okay. Yeah. By prioritizing, of course, yes. right? I mean, right, mm -hmm. right. Um, and and so there, are, um, and then the, uh, the, where do we get all, where do we get the staff? Is, did they come from AVA yep. Yep. then? Okay, and are they doing? Are they pulling extra duties, or their, did their did their assignment just shift? Yep. Just shifted. When numbers shifted, so did staffing. Okay, mm -hmm. and and are the the Edmentum teachers? Are they also Janesville staff then too? Right. So yeah. in option five, yes, the school okay. district of Janesville teachers. In my particular case, I was able to capture some pieces with. Uh, for example, I had a lot of early grads. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. early graded yeah. about half, or I'm sorry, a quarter of my senior class, right? Yeah. So there were some places I could capture mm -hmm. some things in terms of staffing. Okay. Master. Oh, and mm -hmm. so when students, some students made the decision to move from ABA to Craig or Parker, we were able to then shift some staffing to go mm -hmm. along with that. Okay. And he was one of the, the teachers that you. moved. Okay, so he's with MLK. Yes. He is with MLK. Yes. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. I wasn't sure where these people were. Yep. And then how many, just rough estimate, how many would you say are in self-directed learning, seniors only, and then option five? Yep. Right. So in self-directed senior learning, we call that the Beyond Plato plan. Um, I have about I have about mm, mm -hmm. which is that Edmentum program offered on the off day. I have a little over 200, maybe 225 kids that we've invited. Yep. Um, and like I said, we're not all the way through everybody coming in. Right. Literally, they started this week. Yep, yep. We're, so. we're in the same process where we're just launching this. Um, we've targeted about 125, and that could grow. I mean, we want to make sure that we're inviting the kids that will take advantage of this and make the best use of the resources that we have. And if we can get them through, then we'll move more through.
I just want to commend. I I, I want to make sure that you recognize how extraordinary what you just heard is. Frankly, bridges and this presentation, right? You're seeing examples. in place and restructure departments that realign the work that they're doing to support what's happening in the classroom. Um, it's that the, these are unheard of things in, in the way we typically do business. And so while the pandemic is, you know, been a real pain in the backside in so many ways, right? Um, we're learning and growing and we're becoming a better organization and the promise about knowing every kid by name, strength and need and the promise to graduate our kids on time, you know, we continue to use those promises that the board has set as the drivers day in and day out for our decision making at every level across the organization. And when you do that and you create the synergy of people working together collaborative, collaboratively, collaboratively, you know, across peer groups like you're seeing Chris and Allison right now, and then across, you know, with the district team and the teacher teams, these are the remarkable things that you start to begin to see happening for kids. And so it starts in the boardroom, it ends up being magic in the classroom. And so thank you for all of your contributions to helping us move forward with this important agenda. So one of the last board meetings we talked about summer school mm -hmm. and what could we do and I'm assuming some things apply from this presentation. And now we know, who our, we know who our state superintendent candidates are going to be. And if you he talked about the need to offer summer school in a different way. Mm -hmm. I think he's talking about a different thing than I'm talking about. But, but it's really not. Are there things we can do here? Are there things we can advocate uh, are there things we can get to the two candidates and say? Be creative like yes. this is what we we mm -hmm. need, and I think locally that's that's clearly been supported mm -hmm. by district leaders and by all of you, and I think that's probably what principals are going to need across the state is some some freedom to think differently about how certain things get done. Yeah. We, we have a great deal of resources that we've been provided. What I think is the key to all of this is the, the door to flexibility has been more open to a greater level than we've ever seen before. Mm -hmm. And it's allowed us to do some things that we've never been able to do. And, you know, whether these resources and these interventions continue for kids for years to come, there are pieces that we will use in other things and that will capture and continue to recycle and hone so that we reap value from that. Um, you know, a lot of what we're doing with our option four and our option five kids, we're archiving all of that. Mm -hmm. So we can bring that back and use that for summer school so we have a better foundation for our kids. So, you know, there's a lot of learning, not only for the kids, but the adults happening and, and change with what we implement every day. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would agree with what the superintendent said, that the reality is in, in Madison, they really don't know what they don't know. And unless you've tried to manage summer school funding with them, um, it is not the same as the school year funding. It's not even close. Mm -hmm. So if that's a barrier, then I think we need to be prepared to ask those questions. And I'm sure the state organizations would support that. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they don't, that they're intentionally not supporting what you're doing, because what you're doing is amazing. But we're not alone. Every district in the state right. and the country needs this kind of help. So when the president said it in Milwaukee a week ago in his uh, town hall meeting, he talked about this. And I'm sure they have no idea in Washington what would be effective. And I think we could help them understand that this could be effective, but we need money to operate it. So that's what I I'm asking. The flexibility or the key to a lot of it. Right, right. So think about that. Okay. Uh, we have a little time to get the answers to those questions, I think. And, and our legislative chair, Commissioner Murray, would love to get more involved with that. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thank and, you. and now returning for a yes. demand visit, uh, Allison Bion and Chris Lau on graduation plan. Encore presentation. Yes. Yes. Five. Yeah. 
as if you didn't hear enough of us already. <laughs> yeah, this will be shorter. It, I hope, yeah. We're actually here this evening on behalf of the entire high school yes. principal leadership team, right? And so we've got all their names uh, represented there. Um, and we'll we'll touch briefly on the, the charter school principal's plans for mm -hmm. commencement in addition yep. to our own. Yep. Um, we've, you know, graduation is something that was a huge miss for our seniors last year. That, that was a hard thing for them. You know, I, I speak as a principal and as a parent of a senior, that was something that was a huge loss for them. The situation was what it was. And as we're looking forward to this year, we put together some initial plans, shared with directors of Mr. Poofall, met with some stakeholders with parents and kids to kind of test the options that we have, took some of their feedback to us, came back to directors, and what we're presenting to you tonight is a combination of the desires of our kids, our families, and us to help celebrate the work that our graduates have achieved. Um, overwhelmingly, people want to have some form of face-to-face -face graduation, and they're willing to have They are planning at this point to potentially hold a commencement either at the Parker or the Craig High School Auditorium. Uh, we can definitely achieve social distancing um, and follow other kinds of, you know, COVID safety protocols, such as wearing a mask. Um, we'll have to limit spectators in those two venues, just like we would need to at Monterey. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, an indoor ceremony is great in that they don't have to worry about rain or just how hot and humid that it is on the day that they've planned to hold their ceremonies. And right now, the thought is that all of their ceremonies would be held either on Saturday, June 5th, or Sunday, June 6th, so they don't conflict with any other district ceremony. Um, it also provides a great opportunity. You're gonna see that these ceremonies, we hope, can be back to back. Mm -hmm. So that if you know Superintendent Poofall, other directors, or even board members wanna join them, celebrate them, it really all occurs over the span of four days, right? Rather than spaced out over multiple weekends. Plus it's responsive to families. We never want yeah. anybody to be in a spot where they have to choose which relative's graduation they would go to if they have the opportunity to do so. And if family is in town, yeah. they could do all of the ceremonies in mm -hmm. one weekend. Yep. Yep. As far as our plan, um, what I would tell you on the initial end is take everything that you think of when you visualize our graduation, set that aside. In order to achieve what we're asking, <laughs> it will look different and it will require some flexibility on all of our parts to make that happen. But we do think it's quite possible. Um, what we would like to do is have a ceremony outside at Monterey. Um, you know, obviously if there were weather issues, we couldn't move indoors. You cannot socially distance that number of people in either of our buildings. Um, we would have Craig graduate on June 3rd. Parker would graduate on June 4th, both at 7 p.m., much like we already do. Um, the setup is going to be key. Um, we're already, we've already looked at the stadium and looked at the facilities and started to make plans about how could we safely distance um, guests that would come and safely distance our graduates. And we think that we can achieve that. You know, things as simple as how do you do the processional with kids to pomp and circumstance coming in has to be rethought and has to be revised in order to make that safe. But We've had initial conversations and we think we can definitely do that. Um, the other piece is we would need to limit the number of guests. Um, we would do this as a ticketed event, much like if we had an indoor graduation. We would limit the number probably around two, maybe a little more given numbers, but to look sort of like what the plan we have in place for athletics at this point. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, We've one of our vendors that does the sound for us every year has the capability to live stream the event. So we could simulcast both graduations um, as we're doing it. So family members and friends that want to celebrate and want to honor grads but can't be physically at Monterey have the opportunity to see what's happening. Um, 
if and if we had a weather issue and needed to cancel, we've already reserved tentatively the resources so we could do that on Saturday. Um, and we have it spaced out so you could do a Parker and a Craig graduation the same day if need be um, and turn over and um, accommodate both schools. Um, again, you know, that it, it has to be outdoors. The only way you could achieve something like this is if you had ample space to socially distance. Um, we'd also, we want to have a, a picnic for kids um, as a send off for them um, because a lot of the things they normally you would do, they've not been able to do. They've not had a prom, they've not had a homecoming, they've not had lots of things, but we want to honor and celebrate their accomplishment. Um, they've foregone a lot and they've persevered. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so some additional items that are true for all of the schools, the charter schools and uh, Craig and Parker, um, students will not be required to attend. You know, we mm -hmm. certainly recognize that families are at different levels of, of comfort. Um, and for those who are not choosing to be at the ceremony, we'll make uh, arrangements for them to pick up their diplomas in our buildings. Um, guests obviously will be expected to wear masks, as will all of our graduates, and follow all of the district safety guidelines that are in place. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we should say at the end here, this plan will remain responsive to COVID trends and health guidelines right up and through the day of the event. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that means fewer or more restrictions, you know, Chris and I and the other principals understand that we'll have to flex with that if that happens. Mm -hmm. But we have to set a plan and start to move toward that mm -hmm. to make it happen by June 3rd and 4th. And we've been very honest with our, our kids and parents that at this moment in time, this is what we're proposing, that could all change given how the virus rolls out as we move forward. So it's, it's all pending um, the guidance that we receive. We want to be responsive to whatever the rules are that are in place. But like most events, if you don't start planning them now, you can't pull this off at the last minute. Vendors need to be contacted. Families want to know so that they can make plans. Um, there's a lot that goes into this, and we just want to be responsive of the, the needs and desires of everybody before we get close to that date. I'd entertain a motion to approve the 2020-2021 graduation plan as presented. Motion by Michelle, second by Lisa. Any other questions or comments? Those in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries 9-0. Thank Thanks you. for bringing Thank that forward. Much. Finance, Buildings, and Grounds Committee Report, Commissioner Ardry. All right. Well, I'm going to need Mr. McCray's help here for the first couple items to mention. Um, and we have seen no results on the referendum borrowing, but I'd like uh, Mr. McCray to share a little bit of how we arrived at what we arrived at. Thank you. And uh, we had Mike Clark from Barrett attend the Finance Committee meeting, and he kind of gave an overview of the borrowing in and of itself. And so the parameters resolution really helped. Uh, and again, I'm kind of paraphrasing Mike a little bit in terms of we were able to, as a district with Barrett's assistance, uh, pick a, understand the market at the time and pick a really good sale date and essentially sold our bonds at, I believe, a 1.06% increase. Now, you know, <clears throat> Commissioner Hayworth and, and others signed off and, and you'll see kind of higher interest rates. And the thing to note is, is we received a premium where essentially bond buyers giving us dollars um, to purchase our bonds. And that really reduced the overall interest rate to what it netted out as I believe a 1.06. So the parameters resolution helped. Uh, it was an opportune time to strike the market and we received a very good um, interest rate for us. So does that meet your intent? Perfect. What was rate again? 1.06%. Okay, any questions? And then we're going to hop around here a little bit. And if you could um, uh, share the audit result. Sure. And my apologies, I did not bring those audit reports for those who did not attend the finance committee, but we'll be sure to get those out um, to you. Um, so in short, uh, and uh, in respect to
across these disciplines from our single audit related to federal funding and those departments that receive federal funding um, to, you know, it's submitted to the Department of Public Instruction by December 1st. And during that period of time, it's not certainly a 24 hour initiative, uh, but it's ever present uh, in our minds during about that five month audit cycle. Um, so that's again, kind of it in short. Perfect. And the audit report is in our packet. So unless someone wants a paper copy, they can request that. We don't need uh, sure. paper copies. Okay, very thank, good. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thanks Dan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a couple of the other items from the board share as we had a presentation about the student nutrition program. And, you know, in some ways it felt like a love session for Mr. Uh, Jim Deegan. Um, well deserving though. And um, as he shared all of the fine work that the full service group did during the pandemic um, and being able to feed kids been able to do it in a safe manner and provided over and over again and asking about the virtual options and being available to stop by, get meals, take multiple meals home. And it was just a wonderful example of what we can do and under his leadership. So um, with his team. And the other item um, of note a couple other items of note. The budget development, I think we'll get more into that. Um, and I think it'll mean more once the uh, legislature and the governor have finalized the biennial budget, then we can actually get into some, you know, the real work there with that one. So other than that, um, but still the, the parameters of working toward that, um, Mr. McCray and his team have been starting to work toward that based on uh, the assumptions that we provided. The student transportation contract uh, request for a proposal. Um, did we set a time frame when that was going out? I don't believe we actually discussed that, but anyway, we're gonna be going out to the vendors to see who's interested in being a supplier. Not to say that we go away from our current supplier, but quite frankly, you know, and I guess I look at it very much in, in my job, the suppliers that we have, we value them and hopefully they value us. So it's an opportunity to have that shared partnership and valuing each other. Um, that's much of what you go out to do these things. So not a not predisposition to say we would be going away from current. We will if necessary, but that's not necessarily um, the drive behind this. And lastly, as we look at the capital maintenance projects, um, not much has been um, happened, of course, with the really cold weather. Um, but as I say that, kudos to the custodial maintenance group for doing the fine work of um, cleaning snow and keeping uh, buildings um, such that they could, we could have staff and students in them um, with reasonable temperatures inside. Um, but we'll really see more work toward the capital maintenance projects um, over the spring break period. So I look forward to the April report. Whoa, April. Hmm. Well, maybe I won't be doing a report in April, but... Uh, <laughs> as we'll talk about the finance um, buildings and grounds committee that is uh, completes my report. I read the uh, Jim Deegan report. That is an unbelievable number of meals. And I know uh, our children, our grandchildren attend school in Greendale, Wisconsin and the food service there does a remarkable job too. I, I just kudos to the people who are behind the scenes, all the employees who make that run. It's just, it is absolutely amazing to me. And it's a, it's a key part of keeping those kids educated to have them fed. So really appreciate you know, I that. I thought the same thing, especially like with the challenges they had with supply. And I mean. It, it is, it is unbelievable. And it really, uh, I know that they work very closely with their vendors 
who really help package how we manage some of those things. So I, kudos. I mean, it, people just take that for granted. They take for granted that the sidewalks are shoveled and they take for granted that the roofs don't leak. And that's not magic. There's people behind the scenes doing all that work. So I, I applaud all those people. Well, we have come to the end of our meeting. We have a couple of meetings coming up. Personnel policy committee meeting is scheduled for March 1st, which is next week, Monday at 4.30 here at the Educational Services Center. We have a board meeting on March 9th, which will have a couple of closed items. And we're featuring uh, Commissioner Ardry is bringing a team from the Multicultural Teacher Scholarship Program. And they're going to share the successes that program has ha had in our district. Finance Building and Grounds, March 15th on 2021 at five o'clock here at the ESC. I think that's it. We have no second board meeting in March. We we'll only have one in the month of March. So we are at the end of our agenda. We are adjourned.